Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this session of the Northwest Wisconsin Lakes Conference. My name is Mike Engelson. Um, I'm your moderator for this session, Whose Water, Our Water, an Outline of Wisconsin's Public Trust Doctrine. I'm the Executive Director of Wisconsin Lakes, the statewide nonprofit of lake associations and districts. Um, and this session, we're joined by Michael Kane of Wisconsin's Green Fire. Michael was the lead attorney. Um, for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in their wetland and surface water regulatory program for 34 years. With his work with department staff, Wisconsin has developed a program which continues to be a national leader in surface water and wetland protection and conservation. He was involved in drafting, developing, and enforcing laws and regulations protecting Wisconsin's waters under the public trust doctrine. Mr. Kane obtained a BS in biology from UW Stevens Point in 1972 and a Juris Doctor from UW Madison in 1976. He retired from the DNR in 2009 and is now on the board of and co chairs the Public Trust Wetland Committee of Wisconsin's Green Fire. He's going to be talking to us, um, of course, about the Public Trust Doctrine. A few uh, things before we get started. If you have questions, please type them in the chat. If you happen to be new to Zoom, you can access that chat box um, down at the bottom of the screen. Just hover over where it says chat, click on it, and then you can type your questions in. I think most of us have probably already seen that as well. Um, and if you have uh, hopefully positive reactions, um, at least under some versions of Zoom, there should be a reactions button over to the right down at the bottom where you can give a thumbs up or a hand clap. There's also in the participant box, um, some options that you can give feedback as well. So I'll be taking the questions and uh, if they relate to something that is being talked about in the session, uh, interjecting those and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to talk as well. So. On the public trust doctrine, I'll turn things over to Michael Kane. Thank you, Mike. Um, and thank you uh, for all of you who are participating on what is here in Madison is a nice uh, summer, summer afternoon. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, so you have a, a, an understanding of my background. Uh, before I get started, I wanna point out two things. One is that there is a handout within the tile uh, that's online, uh, which is a just a general handout that Wisconsin Green Fire has developed uh, dealing with the trust doctrine. We also have materials on our website, Wisconsin's Green Fire, about some of the things that uh, we have been dealing with in the legislature and elsewhere um, on uh, water issues. And so you can look those up there. I also wanna give a shout out to Bruce Neeb. When I look, click through the tiles, I see that Bruce Neeb, who used to work at DNR, is online. He's a member of Greenfire, and Bruce was uh, intimately involved in putting together this PowerPoint. So I want to give him credit for the PowerPoint that uh, you're going to be watching today. Um, I'm glad that uh, you're interested in the public trust doctrine. Um, it's a great story, I think, and an important tradition in our Badger state. Um, and I'm sure that some of you, I know that some of you are very familiar with it. For those of you who aren't, um, I hope that you'll be intrigued with it um, and that you'll join um, you know either the lake association or green fire or others to be involved in personal or community action relating to uh, our public trust uh, or just by telling people about it families friends neighbors about the public trust in wisconsin's waters i know that many of you know the answer to this question some people don't but um, does anyone know who owns the waters in wisconsin lake or stream how about the fish or wildlife um, and I know some of you know, but um, you know, the answer is that we all do. Uh, no one person uh, or, or group of people can claim that bounty for themselves. Not the waters, the fish, the birds of the sky, the game that thrives along the shore. Um, long before we were here, the native people in Wisconsin applied these same concepts and traditions of common rights to nature's bounty, preserving land, water, fish, and wildlife for seven generations into the future. This is the tradition that we hope to honor today through our laws and our personal actions. Also, um, laws establishing public rights are also found in Greek, Roman, and English law dating back centuries. Um, the England's Magna Carta in the 12th century preserved the rights of fishermen to haul their nets onto beaches and presented, prevented the king from giving seaside fisheries to to English lords. Um, when Wisconsin was created uh, out of the, when the Northwest Territories were created, 
Um, the America's founders used this public trust concept in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And you can see the map on the screen and the states that were carved out of that Northwest Territory. And um, they, they stated in the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 that the navigable waters and the carrying places in between shall be common highways and forever free. And those exact words were put into Article 9 of Wisconsin State Constitution when we became a state in 1848. Um, back then, as many of you know, the rivers and lakes were the highways that people used. Uh, there were no roads. You know, the traders, trappers, and settlers relied on water for getting around. So it was really critical that these be maintained open to the public. Uh, the bottom line here is that it's a very, very old concept. It's one that's been honored over time and served people well throughout much of the world. Um, how does it really work in Wisconsin? Um, you know, as a lawyer, I, I worked a lot with this and I was, uh, when I went to law school at UW, I was astonished. I had not heard of the public trust doctrine before then and I was astonished at the development that had, had occurred uh, through case law here in Wisconsin. And, and Wisconsin actually was one of the most progressive states as far as developing uh, this line of cases. Um, this is a picture of a, of a trout fisherman. Um, one early June day in 1898, a man by the name of Frank Wade walked down the road and waded into um, the Willow River for some trout fishing near Hudson, Wisconsin. Um, shortly after he entered the river he was and caught some fish, he was arrested and made to leave the river by officers of the Willow River Club a private fishing club um, with uh, many members from the Twin Cities who had come over and bought this, uh, all the, the land along this beautiful stretch of the, this trout stream. Um, you know, how could that possibly happen? You know, in many places in that time, uh, groups and individuals had begun to treat lakes and streams as their personal property. Um, Frank Wade had fought in the Civil War. He wasn't gonna give up easily when he and the others um, what he and others had always been able to share. And so while the Ruler River Club fought to keep what they had taken, the Wisconsin Supreme Court sided with Frank Wade based on the forever free language of the Constitution, which is up on the screen. And as you can see, tracks verbatim um, the, the language from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Uh, so today we all have the right to fish in Wisconsin streams and lakes and no one can deprive others of the right to fish. So we owe a, a debt of gratitude to Frank Wade. A dozen years after Frank Wade's fishing trip, State Senator John Paul Husting uh, hunted on part of the Horicon Marsh uh, here in so southern Wisconsin that had been fenced off by a private group, the Diana Shooting Club. He hunted ducks and was arrested by private security men uh, who were hired by the, sh the shooting club. Through his arrests, trial, and appeals all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and he was a lawyer and handled the case himself, uh, hunting was added as a public right along with fishing. The you know, Supreme Court also established the principle that the public trust to, is to be interpreted broadly to the benefit of all the people. Uh, when I was an attorney at DNR and every brief I wrote, I, I quoted this case where the court said that the public trust doctrine quote, should be interpreted in the broad and beneficent spirit that gave rise to it in order that the people may fully enjoy the intended benefits under the trust doctrine. Um, the trust doctrine isn't just limited to fishing and hunting. In 1951, a Green Bay attorney by the name of Virgil Minch, who loved to, uh, to paddle the Namakagan River, um, they went to the Supreme Court with his stories of paddling the river and they argued against a proposed dam uh, that was going to be placed on the river at that time. Um, the court denied the permit, the issuance of the permit for the dam and stated that enjoyment of, of natural scenic beauty is a public right on Wisconsin's um, rivers and lakes. Now, some of you are probably not old enough, but some of us who are old enough remember the days when uh, the Milwaukee River and the Wisconsin River were, were heavily polluted um, and were not fishable and swimmable. Uh, when I went to undergraduate in biology at UW-Stevens Point, uh, we could catch fish in the Wisconsin River, but we couldn't eat them because they just were putrid uh, from all the effluent in the river. 
Um, so before the days of the discharge permits and the, under the programs that currently exist, the Isaac Walton League used the constitutional principles of the public trust doctrine, and it's called to stop pollution and ensure clean water that could sustain fish and wildlife in Wisconsin's waterways. It's important to know the trust doctrine doesn't only protect access to water or hunting or fishing. Um, those rights are only valuable if the lakes and rivers have good water quality and quantity for swimming, boating, hunting, and fishing. And I think as, as all of you know, um, we've made great progress um, in the, those arenas, but we also have current problems um, from you know, groundwater problems to uh, PFAS problems in many waterways, including here in the Madison area and up in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, so, you know, the trust doctrine still plays an important role and there is still more work to do. So this is a picture of a house over the water in the Netherlands. Um, you know, during my tenure at Wisconsin DNR, we had occasions when people tried to put uh, condos and houses out over the water, and we successfully uh, fought those back. Uh, but you know, what if Wade and Husting and Minch, you know, hadn't taken the time to take those cases forward and hadn't won those cases? If they hadn't been brave enough to stand up and expend all that energy and obviously some of their money uh, to fight these uh, these fights, you know, would our shores be lined with things like this private house um, over the water? I know that um, during my tenure at DNR, we had one particularly persistent condo developer who wanted to cantilever um, condominiums over the waters in Sturgeon Bay and park large yachts underneath them in, in uh, enclosed garages. Um, and, and it was a battle, but because of Wisconsin's public trust doctrine, um, you know, they did not succeed in moving forward with those, those sorts of projects. Um, since the days of, of Wade, Husting, and Mensch, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has continued to describe the rights that we share in lakes and rivers. The legislature set up a decision-making system for water activities, basically prohibiting filling, draining, building in or over, or similarly harming the rights established by the courts without permission of the state. Uh, the DNR is assigned the responsibility for those day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, prior to the DNR, it was the Public Service Commission, and before them, the Railroad Commission. Um, and they've all built on this heritage. Uh, statutes, rules, and court decisions contain the details of uh, how it's administered today. Our three branches of government continue to share the legal duty as our trustee to maintain and to grow the extent and value of the public trust in Wisconsin's waters for all citizens. Um, obviously, there are private rights in water, and I understand that Mike talked about some of those uh, in the ses earlier session, and many of you are very familiar with those. Um, waterfront owners clearly have the rights to use adjacent water for a pier, for erosion protection, um, for some agricultural or personal irrigation, uh, but these uses must be reasonable. And the trust doctrine helps us balance the, the rights of those private landowners against the rights of the general public. Um, and well, you know, those are valuable private rights. Um, they have to, um, be done in conformity with the trust doctrine. Now this is a picture that's on Lake Mendota, which is my favorite lake here in Madison. Um, these are, are boat houses and, and summer cottages that were built many, many years ago. They're now on the, the um, list of historical uh, buildings um, and they are quite interesting and I go by them fairly regularly, uh, but it's not a good way to develop our shorelines. Um, so the trust doctrine not only pro prohibits direct physical harm or privatization of lakes and streams, it's also the basis for essential limits on land-based activities that harm, diminish, or devalue the trust. As an example, after draining and filling many wetlands in the early 1900s, we recognized that the resulting flooding and water pollution uh, were a problem. In an action bought by Marinette County, the Supreme Court firmly established that waterfront property ownership didn't include the right to fill wetlands adjacent to public waters. The legislature has recognized and helped avoid harms to lakes and rivers when it passed laws requiring public access in 1957 and shoreline zoning in 1965. You know, we might think of the clean water laws of the 
70 is stemming from the Federal Clean Water Act, but Wisconsin's unique laws protecting all waters of the state are also based on our public trust doctrine. Um, all of you can think of other activities that impact water. And as most of you know, there's always tension uh, between the rights of, of upshore upland property owners and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the public. And I think that we've done a fairly good job of balancing those interests, but there are cases pending before the Supreme Court uh, right now that will probably be decided in the next uh, you know, eight to 12 months that will further um, you know, enhance and carry forward the, the trust doctrine. Uh, what about isolated wetlands that hold stormwater during rainstorms and supply regular stream flow? Um, whether they're attached or separate from a lake or stream, all wetlands are important, important for clean water, fish and wildlife, groundwater supply, and flood storage. Um, Wisconsin has been a leader in protection of wetlands. In 2001, um, we were the first state to pass a bipartisan bill protecting wetlands that had been deregulated at the federal level. Um, right now, there are some new waters of the U.S. Um, rules that have been published uh, in Washington. Um, those are under litigation. Um, the state of Wisconsin Attorney General has joined uh, 14 other states in challenging those rules because they would deregulate a large um, percentage of, uh, of wetlands um, and small streams um, in Wisconsin and other states. Uh, there was just a hearing held in the uh, in California, in the, which is where the multi-state lawsuit was filed yesterday. Uh, the states are seeking an injunction, um, and we'll know in about four days whether that court is gonna issue a nationwide injunction or whether those rules will go into effect in Wisconsin on the 22nd of June. So there's a lot of activity continuing uh, in this area, and uh, Green Fire is gonna be involved in it, and um, perhaps uh, many of you who, who are watching this today um, will both be interested and perhaps be participating in some of the activities associated with that. Um, other issues that affect our waterways are uh, groundwater pumping that potentially can dry up lakes or streams. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the, uh, the issues that are ongoing in the central sands in Wisconsin, where there have been lots of high capacity wells approved which have drained down a number of, of lakes, natural lakes, and a number of streams. Um, and uh, the people who have houses and who utilize those resources are having, have had significant impacts historically. Uh, with current high water, I think it's not, as I understand it, it's not quite as much of a problem now, but this is one of the cases that, again, um, I just talked to a lawyer who's involved in those cases, and they think that they will, it will probably be argued this fall with a uh, decision coming out sometime uh, early next year on what the authority is of the Department of Natural Resources um, you know, to look at cumulative impacts under the trust doctrine and to address impacts uh, to navigable waters that may occur um, you know, due to, due to um, that sort of pumping. Um, how do we know if an activity has an impact, either negative or positive? on public rights. Um, we use scientific methods to do that. You know, I have, an, I, when I was at DNR, I had an undergraduate degree in biology and I, I dealt with a lot of cases where we were looking at the impacts of, uh, of structures and, and um, construction activities on waterways. Uh, this is a slide from one of the cases I handled where we had a large deck built out over a, uh, a lake in Marinette County. On the right side, um, we sent divers down and you can see that there was a depauperate environment with virtually no aquatic plants. And outside of that deck, um, you know, there were abundant aquatic plants. And I know that aquatic plants can sometimes become a nuisance, but I do a lot of fishing and when people talk about the weeds, I tell them, well, they're actually plants and they're actually the forest of our waterways and they provide a lot of habitat. And in this particular case, um, we were actually able to get pictures of the perch spawn that had been laid over the aquatic plants that were just outside of this deck. Um, and so it's important that we use scientific methods uh, ranging from simple observation of uh, visible features to long-term research studies 
so that we can effectively address um, you know, what the impacts are to our waterways long term. Simple observation compares the effect of the pier on the right and, um, and the, the picture on the left. And this is something that I know that um, you know, DNR is involved with, uh, extensions involved with, that local lake groups are involved with. And I think it's critical um, you know, that, um, that we all look at the science and try to utilize that science as we look at how to deal with these issues going forward. Um, Wisconsin has also been a leader in um, some of the long-term uh, research. Um, there was pioneering work done in Wisconsin lakes, which has led to the understanding of critical but less visible relationships. This is a picture of Burgi and Jude sampling on Lake Mendota in 1917. Um, many of you probably know that uh, Lake Mendota you know, has, has one of the longest histories. Of, um, of lake study of any place in the, in the world. Um, and there's been a lot of pioneering work done in Wisconsin. You know, scientific understanding of how water temperature, dissolved gases, or organic matter affect plant and animal life in lakes. It's knowledge that can be applied today in decisions under the public trust doctrine. And it's something that, um, you know, I think that the Department of Natural Resources and many groups are effectively using today. Uh, well-developed science like lake monitoring, and I suspect some of you are involved in those activities. Uh, new technology like drones. Uh, when I first saw this slide, I was like, what is that? Uh, it is a drone. Um, you know, I personally was never involved in this, and some of you may have been. I looked it up yesterday, and apparently they use it to monitor algae and plant growth um, and water temperatures. Uh, but um, you know, we, we have become more sophisticated in measuring um, you know, things that are happening in our water bodies to determine water quality on waters throughout the state. Um, you know, these facts can be used to measure the effect of proposed activities on policies and programs, and I think it's, it's critically important. Um, if any of you are interested, um, you know, in, in more information on the history of the public trust doctrine, um, there is online on YouTube um, a, a series, I think they split it up into three uh, films called Champions of the Public Trust, A History of Water Use in Wisconsin. Um, this was done by a group of people when I was at the Department of Natural Resources back in the, I think the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's really an excellent resource for those of you who are interested in, um, in doing a little more research on this. Um, you know, you heard the story today of Frank Wade and others who took direct action. But um, you know there are there are other things that many of you can easily do today. Um, you know, ask questions after this talk. Um, you know, take a fact sheet. Uh, we have attached to uh, in to this a fact sheet that Greenfire has uh, has put together, which I mentioned at the outset. Uh, pass it on to other people. Um, you can click on the Greenfire website, as I said, and you can um, can print off copies of that. Um, the Champions of the Public Trust is a good source. And you can schedule a training session from Greenfire. Um, when we were planning this summer with the materials that we had developed to uh, basically look for opportunities for us to go out and talk to municipalities and interest groups. Uh, because of COVID, we're not doing that this year, but we hope to do that in the future. And so if you think that there's something that, um, that we can do with some of our scientific expertise and some of our uh, historical knowledge, we would be happy to assist in that. Um, and again, hopefully in the next eight to 12 months, uh, we'll have the post-COVID era and we'll actually be able to do more of that face-to-face. -face. Um, and call us, call Wisconsin's Green Fire and ask for consultation. Um, we try to respond to people when they come to us with questions. And, um, you know, we, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we have 450 members in our organization who have professional experience um, across a broad range of, of uh, natural resources and, uh, and resource management areas, um, including waterways and public trust, and um, we can try to, to offer assistance. Um, you can volunteer with Green Fire. Um, you know, as you know, the last few years with some of the precipitation events, um, you know, we have had uh, sort of astonishing impacts on our waterways in Wisconsin. 
Um, many of you know that the Great Lake waters are now at all-time historical highs. Um, this is up in, uh, in north, uh, northwest Wisconsin, one of the many roads that was washed out up there um, in the last couple of years. And um, so there's a lot of work that is yet to be done. Uh, we are now working to, um, to measure the effect of upland wet, upstream wetland losses and the amount of local damage from some of these floods uh, that have occurred around the state. We're reviewing data on whether wetlands that were created and trade for filling are actually replacing the, the flood retention or other functions of wetlands that are destroyed by filling. Uh, we're looking at whether some of the exemptions that were adopted by the legislature um, in Act 183 um, a year and a half ago are having adverse impacts on, on flood protection and, uh, and, and habitat. Um, and so we're, we're trying to continue to do some work and to work with uh, other organizations to, uh, to basically broaden the, um, you know, the amount of knowledge about these potential impacts. So some of you have heard of Green Fire, others uh, might not have heard as much. What, what do we do? Um, what we try to do is to supply science um, to, uh, you know, to natural resources questions. Um, you know, we, when we, we look at legislation, we look at local activities. We are currently looking at some of the, the national stuff on waters of the U.S. and some of the air program issues. Um, to determine whether from our, our, our perspective, based on the science um, and backgrounds that we have, whether we think that the action is good or bad. Um, we, we won't say that it's good or bad, but instead we'll, we'll use peer-reviewed science to try to identify the consequences. Um, will there be positive impacts? Will there be negative impacts on water quality, air quality, or public health? Um, will plant or animal species benefit or be threatened based on the science available? Will public rights or safety be threatened or promoted? Are there ways we can make these proposals better? Uh, what we're trying to do is to bring as much objective information to the table um, so that um, all parties can look at it. Uh, we've been pretty well received um, by people on both sides of the aisle um, because we're not getting paid by, you know, we, have, we do have some professional staff now that administer Green Fire but all of us volunteers are doing this on our own and not being paid for it. Um, so I think we've established some credibility and we'll try to continue to, to um, do that going forward. So, you know, thank you for listening today. Um, I'll ask you to, you know, join us. I know there are lots of opportunities. There are lots of various groups out there, but um, we'd love to have you join us. Um, Follow us on our website or our Facebook page. And we have a quarterly newsletter. Um, we have work groups um, that, uh, that work on various topics. And so if you're interested in a particular topic or have expertise to bring to the table, uh, we'd be happy to have you work in, in some of our work groups. We have an annual meeting, which this year is gonna be virtual in September. Uh, normally we have, uh, we have one around the state where we get together face to face and hopefully can do that next year. Um, Green Fire was founded by biologists, engineers, attorneys, writers, teachers with careers devoted to natural resources and the outdoors. Uh, but we rely on all people to ask questions, uh, lend us your skills, uh, share our mission and information with your friends, family, and your community. Um, and you know, we would love to, uh, you know, to, to work with you and get guidance from you on things that we should be looking at. Um, so in closing, um, you know, whose waters are the waters of Wisconsin? Um, I think most of you probably already knew, but there are waters. Uh, we all have um, the right to use them, and we also ha all have some responsibility to assure that they're there for future generations. Um, and so, um, you know, that's the end of my, my presentation for today. I appreciate your listening. Um, you know, if you have questions, um, I can attempt to answer them. And again, we do have additional resources online um, and contact us with questions if, uh, if you think we can be of assistance. Thanks, Michael. Um, don't have any questions right at the moment, but we'll see if some come in here. I'll, um, I have one maybe. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, this, uh, question from Ashlyn 
County Land and Water Conservation Department is. How does Wisconsin's public trust doctrine fit in with treaty rights and reservation lands? That's from the Ashland County interns. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good and hard question. <laughs> we are we are working with the tribes, um, and uh, we have you know we're trying to uh, to work with them on green fire issues. And they, I think there's always been some tension, um, you know, between uh, state regulation and and many of you know those areas better than I. I, I personally, when I was at DNR, did not deal a lot with the uh, you know with the treaty issues. Um, I think that uh, what we're finding in dealing with the tribes is that I think we have a, you know, we have a common interest in trying to protect these resources. Um, the regulations can sometimes get murky as to who has responsibility over what particular aspects of it. But um, I know when we are at DNR, we, uh, when I was there, we, we tried to, to work with the, um, you know, the, the, the tribes and we are doing that today in Green Fire. Um, to see if we can, um, you know, can basically move things forward in a common, um, a common thread due to our common interests. But I don't have a, I don't have a sharp answer to that question. But I, I, that it is a good question that we're trying to work on. Great, thanks for that. Um, another question's come through. Can you talk about some of the challenges, um, changes to the public trust doctrine? Um, in the last few years, I'd even add, um, do you see any threats um, coming in the future? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that Green Fire was established is that, um, and one of the reasons I and a lot of others who are working on the, you know, the waterways part of it is that we saw a significant erosion of, um, you know, protection of our waterways, um, you know, under the, you know, the, the most recent administrations. Um, you know, they, um, they, they were not looking at cumulative impacts. You know, there's another case that, that isn't cited in, in this outline, uh, but, you know, it was a, a critical case to protection of, uh, of the, um, the state's waters. And that's, uh, you know, Hickson versus Public Service Commission back in 1967 said that, um, it was actually earlier than that, said that, you know, a little fill here and a little fill there, and before long, a great body of water can be eaten away. Um, and, you know, the cumulative impacts on waterways are significant. And we had seen an erosion of the application of that. You know, there was just a recent uh, Attorney General's um, opinion, which changed, uh, you know, how the state was administering the laws relating to to high capacity wells to require the state to now look at cumulative impacts. Um, you know, the case that, you know, there are two cases that are combined cases that are pending before the Supreme Court. You know, the Central Sands case de deals with um, high capacity wells and whether um, you have to look at cumulative impacts and whether you can look at the impacts to um, those lakes and surface waters in those areas. There are some people questioning whether um, you know the state and the Supreme Court should should articulate that the public trust doctrine applies to all the waters of the state, including groundwaters. And I think that an argument can be made hydrologically and scientifically that you absolutely have to look at you know the full spectrum. Uh, so that's going to be an important decision. Um, the other cases, <laughs> excuse me, the companion case that's pending before the Wisconsin Supreme Court deals with what sort of um, limitations and permit conditions can the state of Wisconsin impose on, um, on CAFOs, uh, the confined animal um, facilities that are, um, they are causing problems with um, you know, nitrates and other pollutants getting into wells and surface waters. Um, and there had been some uh, some rulings that uh, there were real limits on what the department could do. And so those are really important cases um, that are uh, you know, currently pending. Um, I know that there, are, there continue to be um, you know, developments coming forward, real estate developments. Um, since I've left the department, I've worked on some cases dealing with uh, you know, people trying to fill in lake bed and put condominiums and hotels and other facilities um, around the state on lake bed. Uh, there was one in the last legislative session in the city of Racine where they proposed to put a hotel on lake bed. So 
I think that those uh, potential intrusions into our, into our waterways, uh, you know, are continuing. And um, I think that, you know, under our state laws, I think they will continue to, uh, to be disallowed. Um, but, um, you know, PFAS is going to be, I think, a, another significant issue. I don't know how much that interplays with a trust doctrine, but, um, you know, it's, a, it's, I think, a critical issue to as far as water quality on the future of our waterways. So uh, it's, uh, I think that there, there continue to be a lot of issues and I think there will, you know, permanently into the future, there will be those sorts of questions. Great, thanks for that answer. Um, another question uh, kind of relating to, I think to the uh, special times that we find ourselves in, in the last few weeks at least, the environmental justice principle of equal access to healthy outdoor environments is supported by our public trust doctrine. Do we know anything about racial disparities in knowledge or ability to exercise public rights? Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a, 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 also an interesting and difficult question. Um, right now, Green Fire is, you know, we put out a statement on, on those issues, we are looking at um, at those sorts of social justice issues, and we, um, you know, being a a group of largely old white people, um, we recognize that you know both within Green Fire and I think within the tech, technical community, um, you know, there are problems that uh, you know go back historically that. You know, a lot of us are looking at in Green Fire trying to see if there's anything that we can do. We are trying to uh, to diversify our both our membership and our technical expertise and bring in uh, students. And then from the standpoint of you know communities that are suffering, you know, due to water pollution or air pollution, um, you know, I just saw some Green Fire traffic on those issues today. Um, you know, we are looking at trying to get involved in some of the lead pipe issues and some of the uh, air issues that uh, you know are currently associated with uh, with those you know social justice questions um, you know they're critical questions that I think haven't received enough attention um, and it appears that um, you know perhaps that I think social media perhaps is uh, is assisting in this um, are going to get more attention uh, but I think that you know there there are critical issues that that we are looking at, and I guess if people have ideas on things that we and others should be doing, we'd be uh, we we would welcome that input. I think it's a a great conversation that we all need to be having, and um, it's something that I think we're going to start talking about in the Wisconsin Lakes um, partnership and within Wisconsin Lakes as well as to how we intersect with all of this. Uh, and how we can do better. So I completely relate to what you're saying. Um, and uh, that got me thinking of another question, not necessarily related just um, to that, but in general, how does the public trust doctrine handle um, access and rights to access and uh, say when access has been established, the removing of that access and things like that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a, you know, I don't think, I think Bruce is not able to talk right now. <laughs> Bruce Neeb was, I know, has been working on those issues. Um, I personally have not been thinking about that and dealing with it. I mean, I think public access is critical. I know when I was at the Department of Natural Resources, we fought many battles trying to get access, um, you know, boat access to waterways. Um, I, some of you may be familiar with some of the battles that uh, we had in, in the, especially the southeastern part of the state where people didn't want access to waters. Um, I just saw a question that came across my screen in the last two days um, that, you know, I don't know the answer to, but I know some of the, uh, some of the groups are working on, on like River Alliance and others, um, where due to um, the increased amount of precipitation, um, municipalities are putting in much larger culverts and one individual contacted the River Alliance and said that a large culvert went in and because of its size it extended um, on each end four feet beyond the right-of-way so it went on to private land and so when this individual who had always gotten access to a lake from that particular roadbed tried to get access to a lake um, they couldn't get on it because they had to cross private property and it was posted. 
Um, so I think that um, you know there are um, there are a lot of good questions. I see that Bruce Neem just posted a note which uh, I saw flash up and I and then it I di it disappeared. Perhaps uh, you can read that, Mike. Um, it, he did say DNR has a good website on rules associated with discontinuance of public access to waterways. And Bruce, I did unmute you if you have anything that you want to say. <laughs> if not, feel free to stay quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Bruce. Oh, he has no microphone, he says. Ah, got uh, it. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you've got if you've got access questions um, and you can't get them answered elsewhere, um, shoot them toward Greenfire, and uh, we'll work with Bruce and and others to see if we can assist you in answering them. Sure. Uh, several other questions have come in in the interim. Um, uh, Tim asks, can you talk about recent federal rules related to defining waters of the U.S. and navigability and um, does the public trust doctrine give us some protection from those rules? Um, well, yeah, it, right now, Wisconsin has, uh, because of our, the, the, his, the public trust doctrine and the broad definition of waters of the state, um, you know, if the federal rules do go into effect in Wisconsin, uh, because of a statute that we, we got passed uh, by a bipartisan statute that I talked about in my presentation back in 2001, it said that any wetland in Wisconsin, whether isolated or otherwise, that was declared non-federal would be covered under Wisconsin, um, under Wisconsin law to protect wetlands. And so right now we're looking, we're doing work to try to figure out the percentage of Wisconsin wetlands that would be lost, federal protection would be lost on. We think it's something in the range of 50 to 70 percent. Uh, but most of those wetlands would continue to be protected under that statute that was adopted in 2001 in Wisconsin. Um, and from the, uh, the standpoint of the, we also think that the federal rules, if they went into effect, would deregulate uh, something in the range of 50% of the intermittent um, streams in Wisconsin. Um, and again, we have st a statute that defines waters of the state broadly enough that I talked to the DNR lawyers and they think most of those would continue to be protected under Wisconsin law. Uh, we are working right now to try to get a better definition of exactly you know, what the impacts would be. Um, and I think that there's a, you know, we'll know more in about five days. I think there's a fairly good likelihood that there will be a federal injunction put in place or an injunction so that the rules won't go into effect. But if they do go into effect in Wisconsin, um, many of the waters would be still protected under Wisconsin law. Um, we are concerned about a number of things outside of Wisconsin. One is those waterways that in other states that aren't protected you know, will discharge into waters that impact Wisconsin. And the way the federal rules are written right now, uh, about 90% of the pothole wetlands um, in the Dakotas um, would be deregulated. And we think many of them would be lost, which is, could have an effect on waterfowl and, and other resources. And we're, we're trying to get a, we're also looking at those issues and trying to <clears throat> pull together information to see what those sorts of impacts are. So I think the short answer is that because of the trust doctrine in Wisconsin and our history of strong waterways protection, um, we'll be in pretty good shape, uh, but we're still concerned about the long-term implications if those federal rules were to go into effect. Um, and we think that would, uh, you know, in nationally, it would have just tremendous adverse impacts on water quality. Um, because we're far enough up in the watershed of the, um, you know, the Mississippi River watershed and the Great Lakes watershed, um, we're probably less impacted than some of the other states, but we still think that, um, you know, it's bad public policy at this point. Great. Um, this isn't necessarily a public trust doctrine question, but it's one that uh, we get frequently. Um, is Green Fire or any other organization in Wisconsin looking at bringing back local control to the issues of uh, shoreline ordinances? So I presume that means shoreline zoning issues. Um, yeah, and that's that's something that we at this point, um, you know, have not yet discussed. Uh, I think that I know that many, many of our members 
um, and many of the professional members who have worked on these issues historically um, are, are of the opinion that local control um, is a good thing and that there should be more local control of uh, you know, protection of waterways. Um, we're, we don't currently have a project on that, but I know that it's something that we're interested in. Um, so I think if people have questions about that and things that they think that perhaps uh, we can assist on, um, you know, we would be happy to work on that. But, you know, I, our group, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Wetlands and Public Trust um, work group. Um, we're not currently working on that because we have a lot of other irons in the fire, but we think it's a very important issue. And on the part of Wisconsin Lakes, I would say I um, certainly agree that it is a, a very Im important issue and we fought hard to try to not have that happen in the first place, um, but obviously um, did not prevail in the end. Um, it's a hard political climate right now to um, bring that back with the legislature comprised of, of what it's comprised of. Um, I don't think that there's a whole lot of legislative interest in even looking at that issue <laughs> again in the near future. Um, so the more that we can let people know, um, and, and I would say that's true uh, from on the part of the, uh, the controlling party <laughs> right now. Um, the more that uh, if, if that's an issue that remains of importance to people, and it probably should, you know, it's a good thing to continue to have conversations with uh, with your legislators about so that everyone knows that it's uh, an important issue. And, and looking at it from a green fire perspective, uh, one of the things that we are, um, you know, currently trying to do in various areas that we have interest in is to see if, um, in addition to relying on, you know, sort of resident expertise that we have, um, you know, reaching out to consultants who might be interested and also reaching out to the academic community to see if there might be, um, you know, grad students and professors who are interested in doing some research on what the impacts are of the current policies. Um, so if people have ideas about, um, you know, things that might be done, um, you know, to bring some, you know, more objective information to the table as those issues are being discussed, um, that's something we, we would certainly be interested in. Great, and it was pointed out to me privately that I was talking and didn't have my video on so no one could see me. So here okay. I go. <laughs> um, uh, any other questions for Michael? We still have uh, some time for more if there's more interest to um, probe him on things public trust or things green fire. Um, I, I'd just like to say that I think Green Fire has been a great addition to the um, conservation community. It's um, provided a lot of good information and a, a great new partner. So I thank um, all of you for um, coming together in the way you did and um, continuing to do the kind of things that you're doing. It's a, it's a well, well, thank you. And and um, and I, as I said earlier, um, if if you, if you have interest or expertise and you'd like to be involved um, with what we're doing in Green Fire, um, you know, please get in touch and we would, uh, we'd like to have your participation. And I think that the, um, you know, the, more, the more expertise from around the state that we can bring to the table um, so that we can approach legislators and other um, you know, policymakers, um, you know, the better off we'll be in trying to get our message through. Exactly. So, all right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming through, so um, we can end uh, a little bit early if we like. I um, want to thank everybody for joining us and for Michael Kane for providing all that information and um, good conversation. Uh, you can see our partners and sponsors listed on the screen now. Um, so a big thanks to all of them. Um, our break goes now until 2.45 when the new stream or new sessions start up. Um, in this room, I'll be back talking about the impacts of the pandemic on lake organizations and how you're able to run things and um, the status of various programs at the state level and things like that to the extent that I can. Um, so that'll be at 2.45 and from your um, your web page lobby or whatever you want to call it, you can access the other sessions too if 
you prefer. So thanks, everybody. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael.